Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with security and executive protection expert, Ryan Atkinson. I first came across Ryan on Instagram, where posting as Fieldworks, he showed off his connoisseur's collection of small, high-end self-defense blades and other persuasive uh, implements of interest. I quickly realized that Ryan isn't some suburban dad knife collector, such as myself. He actually needs these specialized tools for work. See, he's an A-list bodyguard, a subject matter expert in escape, evasion, and kidnapping, and he'll train almost anyone who wants to learn. We'll meet him and find out more about his fascinating career, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Also, share the show. That really helps. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show in a more monetary type way, you can do so on Patreon. Just go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code. That's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ryan, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. It's great to have you here, sir. Hello. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Sorry, I'm looking at my screen at all the things. I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to look at. Oh, look at my <laughs> How are we? I'm doing well. Thank you. Oh, uh, well, I'm I'm glad. Glad to have you here. And like I said up front, like I, I first got wind of you from your amazing knife collection. I was going down the Pical rabbit hole and a lot of your knives uh, have those qualities. And I was definitely searching for that. But I, then I kind of got hip to a little bit more of you and what you do. And uh, it is more than fascinating. And I had a guest on recently, Tomas Alas of the Tactical Tavern. Mm -hmm. And uh, he mentioned you in taking your class. And I said, I got to talk to you. So, um, well, let's start with uh, what you do. Where did you just come back from? What's your day to day? My head's a million different places. First of all, I love Tomas Alas. Uh, we, we tease and we tell everybody he's my oldest son. And usually people believe it because he kind of could be age-wise. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. Anyway, uh, I just uh, spent five out of the last eight weeks in South America, uh, predominantly Brazil and all kinds of weird places that I hadn't been uh, to before uh, with a couple different acts. So I'm um, stateside for a couple of uh, days at home, and I head back out in a couple of days. I'm back and forth. I'm pretty much out on the road all summer, so I have a 16-week run coming up. So you say acts. What what type of acts are you talking about? Uh, my my specialty are artists that are on the move on tour. So I travel around with artists that are performing for large audiences. You know, um, so. The last eight years, I've been around the, the band Kiss and Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, uh, doing all their tours. And right now, I'm working for a major hip hop artist uh, that I won't talk about my name, uh, but uh, he's he's a major artist, uh, one of the biggest in the world. So we'll be doing this that this summer, and we'll see how it goes. Oh, that is pretty cool. I mean, um, executive protection, I'm not sure if that's the exact word, but uh, this sort of personal security and bodyguarding, so to speak, uh, is fascinating to me because um, inherent in it is a uh, a huge dose of sacrifice. Um, how did you get into this job and um, well, what about it really drew you in? Uh, it's funny. That's the number one question I get everywhere I go. Usually other security people that I'm working with will ask me how I got into the business and how they can uh, do what I'm doing. And uh, it always looks sexy from the outside looking in, you know, but no one really can gauge the amount of hours, days and years you put into it on the road, living at someone else's speed and pace and uh, at their liking. And it takes a certain kind of personality to do that. You know, uh, a lot of the guys that have these A type personalities can't can't adjust to that sort of lifestyle. So um i got into it a long time ago 21 years ago i was playing football at the university of kansas uh nfl wasn't going to work out so i was big for no reason with a college degree and a guy out of kansas city found me uh he was looking after a lot of the touring acts in the world and he said that he heard i could uh, hold my own physically you know i've always been a big physical guy 
and that I had a college degree. And if I could use my brain more than my muscle, that I'd have a job. And um, I said, yes. And he said, get a laptop and get ready to move the rest of your life. And uh, I got the phone call. And a couple weeks later, I was out on the road with Pearl Jam. And I knew very little about the concert business or the band itself or really what I was doing in general. And uh, I just learned on the road. I got thrown in the deep end and I survived. So um, I had never really gone to shows or been around a, a fan of anybody really my entire life. And I, I was kind of uh, an outsider and everyone knew it. It's very apparent. I knew nothing about the industry <laughs> and everyone loved it. I was this big goofy dude that was really strong and but intelligent and I was there to learn. I soaked it up like a sponge. And 21 years later, I think I've been there and done that in this world. You know, do you think that uh, that whole aspect of you not really knowing uh, who the artists were or not being really uh, hip to the scene, so to speak, do you think that gave you a, uh, a level of uh, detachment that was helpful for your clients? I think so. You know, sometimes it's good to do research. You know, it's good to have a general background. I mean, if it's threat related or you know, beef within the industry or discrepancies with other artists or musicians or actors or whatever it could be, you should know about that so you could round the curve. But um, as far as watching every episode of that show you did 10 years ago or some reality bit you did, it really has no bearing on what your job is day to day. So, you know, for example, I've been around Gene Simmons for eight years and I never watched one of his TV. I don't even know what it's called. (laughs) (laughs) So I never watched one minute of one episode and it doesn't really matter. It has makes no difference, you know. I uh, I know Gene Simmons is quite an intelligent guy. I bet uh, I think he went to Yale or something like that. I bet I bet you guys had some amazing conversations on the road. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> uh, Gene's an interesting guy. You know, I'll put it like, I'll put it like <laughs> yeah. interesting guy. You know, we we the conversations are very much like dudes have behind the scenes. It's not. It's not very intellectual between us, you know. <laughs> <It's pretty simple. laughs> so, what what in your personality do you think uh, made you makes you good for this job, and and not just good for the job, but uh, made you someone who has excelled and um, uh, grown in the job? Um, I think the, the willingness to be able to make a few mistakes and be able to brush it off and not take things personally uh, that's a big that's a big deal. Um, learning fast on your feet is the biggest thing. It doesn't really have to do with security nine times out of 10. It could be just you as a person and the environment and the setting and fitting in. Um, I'm not always around secret service dudes and FBI dudes. I'm around hairstylists and publicists and lighting guys and audio dudes and whatever it is, wardrobe chicks and whatever you want to call it. Um, so I have to blend in with this environment and be part of this bigger function, right? You're just a little piece of this whole puzzle. So understanding that, having a, a grasp of the bigger picture will help you more than being able to roll jujitsu at a certain level, you know, in most instances. So being a good communicator and uh, being, a, being able to adjust on the fly with just about anything is a talent you have to have. So you use the term, uh, look, pardon me, looking around the corner, seeing around the corner. Um, How do you how do you keep abreast of emerging threats and and how um, things are changing with the way people are trying to get at uh, your clients? Yeah, Uh, a lot of people, when they think of threats, they think of a threat in a static sense. Uh, So. Uh, Threat X is here and it's going to happen here at this location at this time, Uh, but everything's very fluid. And when you move like I do with the people that I work for, we move so fast that we often run into the threat, you know, or we pass by it uh, often or uh, our baselines of anomalies, they change because if we see the same people over and over, it's very apparent because we're moving fast, you know, so to see the same person in your neighborhood, it's normal, but in the, in the speed and the, and the distance that we travel, it's almost impossible to run to the same face. Mm-hmm. So people pop up, they stick out very clearly. Um, and especially when you're in different parts of the world, you know, you can see what belongs and what doesn't belong. Um, a KISS fan in America looks much different than a KISS fan in Argentina. Um, so just understanding that and, and being around the world in different environments and different locations, you know, you can see the differences pop up right away. Um, so much like a pilot getting ready to take off in an airplane, pushing all those buttons, right? 
I always tell people that they're doing bang, 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 all these switches, and it must be some kind of wizard up there. But you do the same thing when you get into your car and press the defrost and windshield wipers and the rear view mirror and everything else. It's just a matter of repetition and doing it. So my skill comes from just doing it over and over. I talk to people. I'm engaging with people 20 hours a day on work days or non-show days. And uh, I'm just communicating constantly. I'm not watching TV. Mm. I'm not taking breaks. I'm just running into humans and making plans. And people just pop up. <laughs> you can see them like a light bulb in the environment we're in. It's very easy to see who doesn't belong. Interesting. So is that um, usually indicated by or indicative or indicated by behaviors or is it um, how uh, how someone might be dressed or is it all of these kind of things? It, it's all context, right? So I'm, I hang out with weirdos. You know, I, the people that I put on stage for almost a decade wear costumes like a clown. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah giant hair and then flames everywhere and confetti cannons. I mean, it's literally the circus, <laughs> you know? So you would think it'd be hard to stick out around a bunch of clowns, but it becomes <laughs> a lot easier. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's a very specialized environment, you know? So the, the, the baselines are there. You just know what it's supposed to look like. Uh, it could be anything. Context is everything, right? Where are you at? What are you doing? Um, the, the people I work with are very controlled in what, with what they do. When you're going to an interview press junket, you're going to a location, you know who you're speaking to, you know the timing down to the minute. You're doing a 15 minute chunks with 15 minute breaks. You have a lunch break here. And it's like if anything interrupts that, that motion, you know, that, that train that's running, it sticks out to everybody. You know, so you don't really have to be the security guy in these environments, you know, to understand what's wrong. A lot of times people tell me when there's a threat. You know, mm. I've, had fan, I've had fans tell me, hey, this guy over here is weird. And I go, okay, I'm going to go check it out. If we call it pulling the thread, right? You get the little thread in your clothes, you pull on it, and the whole sleeve falls off. So you go pull the thread. That's my job. That's what I'm there to do. I'm not inconvenienced by having to look at something. So I just go check it out. I go talk to people. I'm, I'm friendly with everybody until there's a reason not to be. And uh, you go ask questions. And the answers are pretty straightforward in my world. I know a bullshitter when I hear one. It's just what it is. Like, I've done this a long time, you know, not to sound like the old adage, but it's yeah. true. Well, it's funny because as a, uh, you know, uh, as a layman, I imagine this kind of work, I imagine the physical force part of this work. Um, <clears throat> but in hearing what you're saying, it's so much about your social skills and about your ability with people and to observe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, uh, a lot of times the people that are a threat to the folks that I look after, they want to get their goal is always to get closer to the artist or to the performer. It's not to stay away. Otherwise, it's not a threat. Right. So they're trying to get closer and to get closer. You have to be seen. So a lot of it has to do with some kind of displaced need for uh, attention. You know, so you learn with dealing with folks that are a little out of hand. You know, fan is short for fanatic. Right. So right. keep that in mind. Um, some people take it too far and they feel like they know the person, right? And they want to be seen, they want to be heard, they want the attention. So they're going to throw themselves at you in some way or another, right? So finding them and tracking them down, it's not very hard when they're coming right at you. you know what I mean? So um, some people just know when to peel off and some people don't. And then some faces show up over and over. And then, you know, fans usually click together. They like to get to the, close to one another and create these little groups and clans that travel around, you know, and you'll always spot the loner or the outsider or the other groups will point them out. This guy's weird, you know, and it's pretty easy when you just listen to the people you know, that are around you. So, but keeping an open mind's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, in your day-to-day -day work, have you, uh, in this kind of going up and pulling the thread, uh, does that kind of questioning normally send someone packing or do you end up having to pull the thread more and more and more, it, which happens more often? Uh, you know, it depends on who you're dealing with. Um, I've had extreme cases and most cases are not so extreme. They're just people that are excited and just don't know when to stop. Maybe there's alcohol involved, whatever. Um, but on the extreme side, you know, you're talking about mental illness, you know, so it really has nothing to do with me or the artist. You know, you could Google some of the stuff that I've done in the past if you dig deep enough. But, you know, we've put people in behind bars into prison, actually, you know, uh, from 
repeat offenses and, and, and terrorist threats and create, trying to carry out threats, you know, and getting caught with firearms and plans and everything else. So I've gone down that hole, you know, and it's not great. Once you live in that environment, your whole world just kind of comes to a halt. It's just exhausting, you know, when someone's out outside your house at night and they're going to they have plans to kill you. <laughs> right. So if, if it's plans to kill my the girl that I was looking after, who was a very famous pop star, I lived with her, you know, so it's like that's me, too. You're trying to kill me. So you take it very, very personally, you know, and it's just one of those things where you make all these considerations that you never did before, like how you move anywhere. You know, yeah. and how the routes you take and what you're going to do before you actually move and what you would do to yourself, you know, and you, you start talking to friends about what they would do and start red teaming each other, you know, and trying to figure out what your weakness is. And then it becomes a money thing. And how much money can I spend on the lasers that go around this house? And that's a real thing, you know, so um, it's a hole that you could deep dive into mm -hmm. and electromagnetic locks on your safe room and <laughs> all safe rooms behind the curtains you know it's like it's a never-ending thing you gotta know when to draw draw the line and when to become uh offensive rather than defensive you could you can only hide so much especially if you're a public figure mm, that's interesting uh it it uh it's something i think about all the time having a family and uh having a house and um you know just being kind of a normal guy you know i still have people to protect and a house to protect um and there is that question where to draw the line in terms of, you know, we could spend every paycheck on security and uh, end up with Fort Knox. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, how much how much is that going to help? I think a lot of it has to do with mindset and training. How do you approach training? Uh, you, I, I know you have a physical aspect that you have to approach, but you also have a, a much larger sort of figuring out the street smart angle of everything. Um, so how do you approach your, your training? Yeah. You know, what's funny is that uh, all the guys that do what I do, they come from such different walks of life that there's really nothing, no specific kind of training. I think that makes a person like me go to their job. A lot of it is personality, to be honest, you know, and then jumping into different parts of training, will just make that will accentuate that. Right. So if you're a physical guy and you're in good shape, course that's good for the security guy if you're a conversationalist you can carry on with any any crowd in any form or situation then that's great too um but uh what would you ask me sorry well just, <laughs> just uh, well just uh, kind of how you approach your training because it occurs oh, yeah, to me, you're, you're kind of moving all the time too but the training is, is, a, is a funny thing if you talk to people that do what i do as well as going to say um most of the guys that do my job don't train a whole lot believe it or not they just do the gig, they gig a lot. So they're on tour a lot and they're good at their job because they move people constantly and just they're solid. You know, you can, you can trust them and they're just not very physical or they haven't taken Ed Calderon's latest urban movement class or, or the field works, uh, you know, situational awareness workshop. You know, they just, they're, they're really good at moving Madonna to the four seasons into her jet. You know, they're really good at that. So the training thing gets disregarded by a lot of people that are in the security profession. You know, it's shocking for a lot of people to hear that, but it's the truth. Um, I try to be the well-rounded guy. I, try to, I consider myself the hybrid. You know, I'm a big physical guy, but I also don't be, beat on people. <laughs> I don't go around mugging people. Right, I right. use my words. You know, I stay calm at all times. You know, I'm, I'm a, they look to me for leadership when it comes to the panic button and, and the evac stuff and emergencies. So I'm always cool, calm, collected. If I freak out, you better freak out. You know, so everyone that knows me in the work capacity knows that. They see me mo moving fast, so like they start moving fast real quick. Um, but the training thing, I've always wanted to be good uh, at, at different skill sets, you know, and the gun stuff came from what I was just talking about, what I just touched on with the people trying to, that were outside trying to kill me for whatever reason was in their head. Um, I realized that they had firearms and they had access to more firearms and that I wasn't really highly trained with, with guns, you know, so I set out the best instruction I could find. And I found some really, got, really great guys to train with and they showed me a whole lot. And uh, that just took me down another rabbit hole. I leave the country and no matter what anyone says in the U.S., if you're doing private security, you're not taking your gun out of the country. Yes. It's not happening. This is not Hollywood movie stuff. This is reality. You hire guys on the other end 
that are from that country to be your arm detail and you direct them. So when you're in environments like that, maybe uh, depending on where you're at, you can carry a blade or carry a knife with you. So that's your best uh, level of a weapon available to you, right? So why wouldn't you carry that? And then I found myself with a band or a group that was hugely popular outside the U.S., but not really popular in the U.S. So I spent all of two years outside the U.S.A., which means no gun for Ryan. And uh, so that's when I deep dove on the uh, on the blade work and defensive stuff with edge weapons was when I was that was all I had. You know, why wouldn't I? So it's kind of out of necessity in, in, in my, in my uh, look on it. But um, so then it, that, that, that drove me into the non permissive stuff. You know, I was, I was constantly moving into all these studios and these uh, facilities, government buildings everywhere I went where weapons weren't allowed. But you didn't really trust the people around you either. You get in this weird situation sometimes where you're around government people, but you don't trust anybody, you know, when you get into certain countries. So it's just a really creepy feeling to have. And, uh, you know, you're the last line of defense in this situation, and it's yourself you're protecting too. So that is how you got into knives, being in a non uh, permissive environment for two years. Uh, how did you approach training and kind of uh, getting your feet wet? Well, when I when I started the started the firearm stuff, I looked out. Uh, I reached out to Johnny Primo. He goes by Courses of Action uh, online. Um, Primo is a former team guy that has done a lot of work. Uh, I don't think there's anyone out there that can deny the stuff that he's done. So, shooting people is a specialty, and he he breaks it down into a, a form where you can really really grasp it, understand it, and repeat it over and over. Primo was uh, the first person that, that sparked the interest uh, in working out again and becoming physically fit again. Uh, you know, I played football at a university level in Division I uh, when I was 19, 20, 21, but uh, I'm now, I'm now third, in mid-30s or early 30s, and I'm just, I've fallen out of shape. It happens to the best, you know. You just you get comfortable doing your job, you're busy, you have to start a family, this and that. Uh, you get older, the testosterone <laughs> drops off, or whatever you, you know, it just happens. So, uh, I, I had stayed, I had kept the size, and I and uh, the muscle had kind of transformed into other things, you know. Yeah. So when I went to train with Primo, he told me, "Hey, man, uh, I had some body armor with me and some other stuff," and he said, "You need to get in the gym, dude, and not wear body armor." <laughs> You know, if I can put you on a couch and have you eat nachos and then shoot from the couch, that's what I would do right now. He just leveled my brain. <laughs> my ego is just barely fit into the shooting range, you know, and then he just squished me, you know. And I needed that. I needed that reality check. You know, it's like your physicality is going to carry you through more shit than the shooting skill that I'm about to teach you. So uh, I got on it. This is years ago. So it's been a journey. You know, five years later, I just turned into some cardio monster uh, throughout the path. But Along the way, I sought out different instructors. I like to learn from everyone I can. Um, I show up, and anyone who's been my instructor in the past will tell you that I show up, I do the full thing. I want to be a student. I'm not looking for anything other than to take notes and to get tortured or whatever you want me to do, or get gassed out or smoked, whatever you can do. I want to do it. I want to do it first. You know, so I don't want to see other people fail and stuff. I want to go out there and mess up in front of everybody, you know. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I just thought out the best instructors out there, like Bill Rapier, uh, Amtech oh. shooting, uh, former uh, SEAL Team 6 team leader, um, just one of the most solid Americans you'll ever meet. I mean, the guy is just a monster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he just, he changed the way my, my thinking uh, my thinking is as well. And I fell into Ed Calderon with the Blade stuff, you know, and um, and then I learned a lot more about Ed and, that, and, and what he's into and that the image online really doesn't describe him, you know, so... People that have hung around Ed Calderon for a long period of time can tell you a lot about Ed that has nothing to do with Instagram or Blaze. Uh, the guy is a fascinating man. You know, he's a fascinating storyteller, and he's lived a crazy life. So uh, he shot, he shot, he put a light in my direction that I had never seen before, which was awkward for me because I thought I had seen everything. You know, I had this weird issue with uh, ego and everything else that uh, everyone i think works on to some degree but i'm still working on uh but he helped me uh wrangle that in a little bit and kind of understand different things about deconstructing environments and and uh creating uh, baselines versus anomalies and and understanding context and stuff and and uh it's stuff that i already knew 
but you put it into a formula. It's like giving you four balls, tennis balls. You understand that you have four balls, but if I teach you two plus two, you can put that together faster, right? So it's called shortening the chain. You, you create the shortcuts for all these things that you already know, and it helps you think faster and deconstruct faster. So I thought the whole thing was fascinating with Ed, you know? So I, I, I deep dove with Ed for a couple of years during COVID, and we did all kinds of stuff around the country, and uh, I, became, I started instructing myself. Uh, I want to get to your instruction, but I, uh, in a second. But I, I want to um, understand the shortening the chain of uh, concept. So you're uh, in your reasoning, you're cutting out things that you know. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you just repeat that concept for me? Yeah. So if you have a chain, it's like you're uh, start to finish. You're uh, when you start an action, when you see something, you decide to act, right? So you're OODA loop, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, observe, orient, decide, act, right? So that's your chain. When you see something and you have a file folder for what's happening in front of you, there are certain things that you know from your past experience that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Hey, there's a fire there. That thing might be hot. Mm -hmm. I know because I burned myself before not to touch that. That's the chain. Right? It's that, mm -hmm. that back and forth between whatever you're looking at in your brain. Shortening that chain is just uh, creating uh, acronyms or something like that. So. Uh, if you've ever done any kind of medical training, ABC, airway breathing circulation, or uh, if you're doing S march, scene safety, massive hemorrhaging, airway, respiratory, circulation, head injury, hypothermia. Yeah. So like it's stuff right. that you know, but you're creating this shortcut. Yeah. yeah. ABC, S march, whatever, whatever you've been trained to do. Um, uh, you know, um, different acronyms for going into different environments. You know. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do to shorten that chain to help you remember things faster, right? To access it. So you don't go into what's called condition black or suspension of disbelief where you just, you see something and there's no file folder at all. So you just yes. stop and your mouth draws open, right? That is uh, when I uh, imagine uh, different scenarios, that is the, the worst thing that I imagine is that, uh, is seeing something that I, I can't understand or that is so shocking uh, that it puts me in that state. That That is something um, that I, I feel like pressure testing in training might do great things to, to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about pressure testing? And tell me about the teaching you do. Yeah, so uh, the pressure testing, I think, is is a great thing for whoever wants to do it. I know not every family is filled with people that want to do this sort of thing. You know, we've got a saying, uh, find the others, you know, so don't go telling everybody what you do. <laughs> uh, maybe, Aunt, you know, Aunt Rosie and Granny don't want to hear about you and your friends tasing each other in the nuts, you know. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that want to better themselves and want to and, and create a, a better skill set, you know, uh, when it comes to possibly terrible things happening, you know, because terrible things happen all the time. But to pressure test something is everything to me. Um, everything else is just theory. It's just people talking on the internet. So we say, come out to a class and show me. And if you show me something I didn't know, I'll say, hey, you get credit. We're all just standing on the shoulders of other people. We're, yeah. I didn't invent some, anything. I will never claim to have invented, invented anything. And neither will anyone that's around me. So we're, here, we're all in a, a learning circle. We're here to learn, share stories and experiences and help other people create folders that maybe weren't there before, you know? When I teach classes, I, I say, if you leave this class 1% better, if you learned one thing, then to me, that's success, man. Because if you were to go outside and get into an, an altercation, a, a fight with somebody, and you could reverse time and say, hey, you can be 1% better, you want to do it? You'd be like, yes. Mm -hmm. Every time you'll take that 1%. So um, there are no uh, silver bullets in this kind of work. You know, there's no one shot, one kill. It's constantly doing it. It's drilling. It's learning from different people and just rounding the edges out. You know, do you have to just learn from more people? Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of getting stuck in one circle. You know, I train with everybody. So anyway, I live in Boise, Idaho. I don't think there's anyone in town here I've been shot with. <laughs> and, no, you know, I'm not the best shot. You know, I, I never claim to be. I don't show. I'm not a trick shooter or an Instagram shooter and that stuff. I shoot well, I know what I'm doing, but and I'm proficient, but I still have work to do. It's a perishable skill, and I understand that. And I think that everything is, you know, that memory fades over time when other things fill your mind, you know, whatever it is, COVID or politics and other crap that fills our skull these days. You have to constantly put that in. And uh, pressure testing tells you the truth. 
you know, it tells you uh, that people are different. Um, a lot of the stuff with weaponry, uh, it doesn't work for everyone, you know, so we grab things and we try to teach everyone it's the Indian, not the arrow. So don't get too physically attached or emotionally attached to these items if you don't yeah. have to. They're just, it's just stuff. Yeah. You know, you are the weapon, you know, so picking something up, weaponology classes that we do and making weapons out of things quickly and identifying weights of things in the structure and the wood grain and how to sharpen plastic on carpet and, you know, use Kevlar string to make, you know, to cut someone's head off if you had to. Um, it's just all these weird little skills that kind of put these little pieces together, this giant Rubik's cube that's your mind, you know, you can start figuring things out. And then you get in these classes around a bunch of other weirdos that are that are brainstorming the same crap as you, and it just turns into this beautiful mess, you know. And it's just the things that come out of it are brilliant. Uh, please allow me uh, bef before I get more details out of you, because Tomas Alas uh, had some really cool details from the class, and I want to get a little more specific. But before we do, I just want to show you uh, my family just went to Jamaica uh, for a wedding. Okay. And uh, so I have my little ventilator pen because they're very strict about uh, no knives there. Yeah. And I have my magazine and my daughter's hair ties, you know, so I have a little collie stick here. Yeah. And then the last thing I did was a was a heavy nut mm -hmm. on a small piece of paracord mm -hmm. uh, as a flail. I saw that on, on the Internet. It, it all made me feel better. You know, I'm a I am a knife collector and I've been doing knife related martial arts for a long time to sort of justify it and justify the <laughs> yeah. expense and all the other stuff. And, and I love it, but I've never uh, used any of that stuff. It's all been in a training and experimental uh, mm -hmm. sort of atmosphere. So um, that, that pressure testing is the last bit um, that I guess I would like to um, embark on. Uh, Tomas related the, uh, there, there are aspects of it where the lights are off and there's yelling and there's people throwing you down to the ground and you're being handcuffed and there's screaming and lights mm -hmm. going on. I mean, like chaos when you're yeah. in a normal uh, training situation in a martial arts studio, you got your friends around you. You're <laughs> all there doing fun stuff. No one yeah. wants to hurt each other. Yeah, you might yeah. want to best your friend, but you're not trying to kill each other. It's mm -hmm. a totally different environment uh, than, say, getting kidnapped or mugged. Um, tell us a little bit, some of the details, some of paint a picture for us, what it's like. Uh, yeah, chaos, chaos is a good, good word for it. Uh, control of chaos, you know, the whole time we do these classes, it's, uh, we, we warn everyone. We say, Hey, look, this is going to lead into something. This is good. It's not a surprise. We don't throw water in your face, uh, right away. Uh, it's, it's a lead, it's a build up. you know, everything is, is optional. You don't have to do this stuff. You're here on your own. So, you know, the waivers and stuff, that's one thing, but just understanding that you don't have to do anything you don't want to do is like number one rule, right? So there's always a way out of this. It's going to be fine. So just take it easy. But you should know a few things. Uh, we're going to stress out all of your senses. Like we're just going to be sensory overload to the max. And you learn right away that cardio is the killer. You make anyone suck wind and everything else sucks. If I, if I make you winded right now, mm -hmm. everything else is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's your hierarchy of needs. You know, I need oxygen right now. I don't care what's for dinner tomorrow night. I, I need air, right? So you don't know what color your couch cushions are going to be next year if you can't breathe, right? So it's just one of those things where we make make sure that you can't breathe when you go into this whole thing. Then you just forgot 50% of what you just learned is gone. So that's all the stuff that you've repeated over and over. It's going to stick, you know, all those shortening the chain acronyms is what's going to stick. Um, so, you know, attacking everyone's senses, uh, you know, their sight, their hearing, sense of smell, uh, tactile things, getting your hands put in ice water, you know, being barefoot on uncomfortable surfaces, you know, within reason. Uh, you know, we have little tasers that we use. They're, they're not going to hurt you, but, you know, they could leave little marks, little love marks. Uh, but you know we show everyone in evolutions all these things we don't we don't put it all together just all at once all of a sudden everyone knows these elements are around it's introduced to you beforehand like you know what it is we talk about allergies and <laughs> previous injuries and stuff we're not there to, to kill each other that's not the point of training right so uh bill rapier told me training is only training if you don't get hurt <laughs> right. okay that sounds like uh, like he's still team six dude you know he's like we train to do a job, not to get hurt here, right? So 
let's push each other, but not let's take it easy. We're all friendly here. And that's the vibe going in. But then everything just changes when I say it's going to change. And then, you know, it's fully immersion. And we try to give it an experience and everyone understands that going in. It's like going into a 3D movie. You know, it's not real, but it's just going to be a little bit more painful than the movie theater. Uh, it is uh, it is a different experience being yelled at in the face if you've never been yelled at in the face or to be ordered around uh, or to be um, thrown on the ground on your face. And, you know, all of that stuff, uh, like you said, uh, in this situation isn't going to kill you, but it's going to get your attention and it's going to test and see how you react and see how how you like you said, how you can recall stuff. Yeah. I know you you do this organic medium testing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, especially for blades. You're talking about Bill Rapier. My dad got me this awesome Northman oh. for Christmas. Love oh, you, nice. dad. <laughs> uh, but uh, the um, uh, organic medium testing where you get to try out, uh, I suppose, different knife techniques in a pig carcass. But I, I know that it's uh, a very... Um, you know, you were talking about don't get attached to things, especially these expensive knives that I have arrayed around me. Um, that's for something else. But for the kind of work you're doing here, uh, it's it's what's effective and it's what you're not afraid to use. And it's what doesn't damage your hand. Tell me uh, what your experience is in testing knives. And I also want you to tell me your opinion on ringed knives and how they work out in this scenario. Yeah, the, the blade testing has taught me a lot about edge geometry and, and how it affects organic medium or, you know, a person. And the pig is as close to a, a person as you're going to get without going to jail, right? Uh, and then, first of all, with the pig, we, we always, in any class you've been to of mine where a pig's been hung from the ceiling, uh, gutted and stuff, so we don't get the weird smells in class, but... Um, is that the pig is teaching us something, you know? We didn't just go out there. We're not out here just whacking animals for fun. This is not the, the idea. This is yeah. training. This is something that we thank the pig. You know, everyone thanks Mr. Piggy for his bot, for his life, you know? And uh, we're learning something that could save our lives, right? So a lot of people in our classes come from heavy trauma. And there's a reason they were pushed to a class I find, you know, they've gone through something. I mean, I, I could share examples of, with their permission, but um people that could barely leave their house and show up to one of my classes and now they're a monster you know and just in the best way possible right. and it's like really it's something that i hold close to my heart is changing someone's life like that um but being grateful for the stuff that we're doing you know and not just being you know terrorists to the farm the pig farm it's not what we do so everyone's got it's not there to, we're not there just to mutilate stuff and to, and to be a jackass we're there to learn things you know that to save human life so in context, right? Um, yeah, it teaches you a lot about edge geometry when it comes to hitting skulls and, uh, you know, shoulder blades and spinal cords and what it means to hit a spinal cord and um, hitting different uh, limbs of the body that have two bones, you know, and, and different consideration. Uh, fighting is dynamic, you know, no one's going to stand there and <laughs> let you put holes in them without moving, right? So uh, unless they don't know what's going on. Um, so we show what it does to the blade uh, deformation, you know, like what, what it does to thinly tipped blades, you know, and, and why that could be good or bad. And, you know, show people that even if you break half of your blade off, you could probably keep stabbing that person with that blade. <laughs> so breaking the tip off really doesn't mean a whole lot when it comes to stabbing somebody, very little actually, unless there's heavy clothing involved or some kind of jean jacket or Kevlar in there. Um, where you need extra penetration, but, um, you know, and stabbing through clothing and what that means to your blade design, you know, what, what are snag points on your blade? Um, these are lessons written in blood, you know, so there's people that try things with blades they shouldn't have, you know, and generally ring blades are frowned upon in the reverse edge community uh, or the, the tactical fighting community because of, uh, uh, the, the possibility of degloving your your finger or uh, sleeving your finger, you know, or taking the meat off of the bone around your finger. A lot of the ring blades are made incorrectly if you want a ring blade. Uh, the ring the ring should be smooth, and you shouldn't be able to skin a carrot with it. If you can skin a carrot with your crown bit, you should probably chamfer those edges a little bit more because that's what's going to get bound up when you in a dynamic situation. You're moving your blade stuck in the spinal cord, and now that person's doing a roll on you. <laughs> with your finger in there. Mm, your yeah. finger is not that strong as the two grown human men wrestling around. It'll come right off, right? So 
Uh, we do, sometimes we explore hand passes, you know, where we change the blades to different ha hands. And <clears throat> there's a lot of examples of, of that and with recent instructors doing it. A lot of jiu-jitsu guys are jumping in. And the hand pass is huge. I mean, it, it gets used constantly with skilled guys. So um, that's another consideration. So you don't want to be attached to your weapon, you know. Mm. <clears throat> I guess uh, I guess the ring on a gun would be the trigger guard. I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's the only one you want your finger through. Yeah, it seems uh, I have recently gotten. Um, I, I did recently get a ringed knife that I really love that aligns my knuckles and everything really well. It's a Tkel Night Stalker, but it's been a long time since I've had a, a ringed anything. Uh, when I had Ed Calderon on this show, uh, that was one of the main takeaways uh, from his experience that it can be very dangerous to the user. And, uh, and, and a lot of that comes out when, when you're doing the testing, that dynamic testing on a carcass that's swinging around. Um, again, it's not a colleague class where your friend is going to stand there and allow you to uh, make sure, you know, to test, it's not that it's it's holding on to your blade and swinging around and your hand is attached so it should yeah it should be said you know when a pig carcass a 400 pound pig is, is uh, swaying back and forth and you're not having you don't have people holding it for you and you and you start hitting it with the karamba you start to see what it really is you know especially if you put clothes on that pig you start, your damage level goes way down it's kind of terrible right so you want penetration you know you want that ripping effect is why the call we, we use that reverse the call we use all of our back muscles in it, right? Um, but with the, the Ed Calderon stuff, it's funny because when Ed first popped up and he first became this Mexican uh, taco ninja on Instagram, I, sh I shit on the guy. Like, I was like, what Mexican cop is going to tell me what? You know, and I had worked professionally with Mexican police my entire adult life, and I have a very low view of most. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've never been shy about that. I've been messed with in Mexico so many times. I've got great friends there, too, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of shitheads there. <laughs> so when I heard there was this Mexican cop talking about any kind of weaponry or training, I was like, you got to be kidding me. And I just went right after him. Right after him. And I, I remember making fun of the, the hand slapping. All the hand slapping he was doing was to his, his, uh, his weapon holding hand, you know. And um, it's not until you do things a lot that you realize why that's there, you know. So... If you see somebody doing something, especially in the circles that I try to hang out in, there's a reason for that. It's not just, it's not knife karate. We joke and we call it knife karate. You know, it's just like a, it's like a, a me, we call each other roadies when I'm at, I'm at work. We're not roadies, but right, right, right. hey, roadie, you know. Uh, but man, yeah, knife karate, we're doing some knife karate in the garage, you know. It's like, we just dumb it down like that. But uh, there's a reason for that. That blade gets stuck a lot in a body. You know, and it sounds weird that your hand won't pull off. But if you do that with your other hand, somehow it comes right out of someone's skull. I don't know what the wizardry is there, but I've done it a million times and I can tell you it's true. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And it's not uh, it's not the flowy, beautiful kind of dueling that you might want to that you might want to hope it looks like. Yeah, um, that's that's the other thing that took me a long time to realize uh, is that you know no one's getting in knife duels. That's not happening. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and I love I, I think for self perfection purposes and for fun and for exercise, all of that is so good and so great. Uh, but I also think you know, uh, in all sorts of training, especially in knife training, you know, you have to have a real self preservation outlook too. You know, yeah, when I played football, I took yoga and ballet, but whatever, right? Yes, right. Um, but the Libre stuff and that reverse edge stuff, it all comes from Scott Babb. And, and I don't know if you know the Scott Babb story. Yep. Uh, uh, I don't. Uh, Scott, you know, how he got, got hooked up with Ed Calderon. He was Ed's instructor for blade work. Um, and it became a sub commander for a unit in Mexico, and he hired uh, Scott Babb to come down because these guys were carrying Rambo knives and <laughs> you name it. There's a lot of K bars around the streets of Tijuana, right? <clears throat> and uh, Scott came down and, and taught him his, his method. And the method was created from real life stabbing data. So people that had been in incidents involving blades and there's video evidence of it. He dissected all of it. <laughs> Everything he can get his hands on by region, by date, what the customs, cultural stuff. He just kind of broke down the whole thing into a martial arts system and a science, you know. And uh, Ed was so interested in it that he brought him down and, and Scott taught Ed's guys this Libre fighting system. You know, they were like the first ones to go out and pressure test things. So <clears throat> things got physical. 
And uh, let's just say that Tijuana is not anywhere in America. It's not like it is here, especially when it comes to cartel cops and their and their adversaries, you know? So uh, my understanding is that the system was pressure tested in the streets of Tijuana. So uh, it's not uh, a matter of this might work <laughs> or this is what might happen. This is what happened. <laughs> yeah. So, what happens when you do this? You know, so it's very a matter of fact, and it is actually employed. Yeah. Well, that's a, you know, that's cool to know. Uh, you know, bittersweet, I guess, but it's good to know that uh, these things work, and especially that because uh, because I have put a lot of time and thought into uh, that kind of fighting, that Pekal style of uh, fighting and i can't say i've taken libre but i've kind of incorporated in with the kind of stuff i know and uh, i i just it just makes sense with all the arcing different arcing of all of your joints and and like you said pulling with your back and everything and to me it just uh, especially given the heightened sense of um uh, that your heightened senses from adrenaline and everything else yeah i mean we all have that response mechanism that we carry uh, from the time we're born you know this whole bowling pin thing where we do this you know that uh that blower spear system you know it's like oh yeah models. we do this on uh, by by reflex by instinct we don't have to be taught that to put our hands in front of our face and if you watch babies fight or people that are completely untrained uh or or anyone else that, that just freaks out that everyone fights like this it's that monkey instinct you have is to just do that stomping thing when ufc fighters get that final blow they come down with the hammer fist yeah <laughs> You know, always oh, a hammer that's, fist. That's the nail in the coffin. That's going to kill you. You know, it's like the foot stomp. So that's what we're going for is that I'm going to, you know, I'm trying to end you. This is not some kind of delicate thing happening. Right. This is going to be a brutal altercation that I need to finish now. Right. So that's all there is to it. There is no defense in the system. You know, you're just, you're going after someone with such speed and violence that you overwhelm them and take them down. You know, yes. Not fighting, but fight stopping, basically. Yeah, yeah. Just ending that person, ending the threat, yeah. With as many holes as possible. You're em emptying that that jug of milk, not through the same hole. This is people that have been stabbed 30 times and walked away. I don't think you're going to get a lead race student and get hit 30 times and walk away. It's going gonna, gonna to suck for you. This is, targeting is everything, right? You don't have that ballistic advantage of a bullet, right, or some, some, something coming out of a firearm. It's just that hole or that slit going in. There's a little bit of compression there, but you're not talking about ballistics like from a, a 9 or a 40 or 45, right? Right. So it doesn't have that stopping power. So it's not like the movies. You that one stab and it's over. It's very, very, uh, very few incidents end that way. So it's usually a few more seconds involved. So you got to keep putting in work. You've already made that decision, you know. Right, right. And oof, yeah. And uh, you know, we know from prisons and from untrained mm -hmm. uh, killers with kitchen knives. That's usually how it works. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, before I want to, I want to get some tips from you for, um, just kind of regular people, uh, for travel and for home. But before we do, let me, let me ask you in, in your training, um, besides your incredible knives, the, the knives you have in your collection, I keep talking about, um, what have you found works best in a, in a pig carcass? Is, is it the Victorinox fruit knife? Is it the, um, pioneer woman pairing knife like, <laughs> what is your what have you found that's funny. uh what's the blade oh gosh it's a swedish blade what's it called it's in every store oh the most common uh, blade ever oh my god it's one in my garage uh, anyway he cut uh ed calls it the ak-47 of uh knives you know it's like this one's got more bodies on it than any of your fancy instagram shit are you talking about the mora, mora, mora knife? yeah <laughs> he's like the more the AK and then that one, that's the blade. And I, I take one of every one of my classes too. And I, I say the same joke. Here's the AK-47, the one you haven't seen on my Instagram yet. Um, I think I used to post pictures of it and the fruit knife. Um, it's I've never broken one. So, <laughs> I mean, I've broken all the one, all the cool guy stuff that you could buy, uh, you know, from whatever website your favorite knife maker sells on. But um, eventually they break down. It's a tool. It's a, it's a, at some point your knife gets pointy and thin <laughs> and that part's going to get degraded. Right. So, uh, if you hit it with enough things and enough force, it's going to deform. Um, but the more a knife doesn't for whatever reason, it's 1299 down at the Bass Pro Shop. Um, 
So we, we joke about that. But as far as geometry, uh, when you start making these large processing cuts on a carcass, you'll notice that that, be that bird's beak curvature works best or something that is matches, uh, you know, human anatomy. If you're going to put your forearm out and it kind of rounds your forearm like that, mm -hmm. uh, it's usually what does best. Um, <clears throat> we always raise the tip. So if you're, if you're, if your palms here and your thumb caps here, you want to put your thumb on top. Uh, that tip is raised up slightly above your, uh, your knuckles for point of aim, point of impact. Because if that tip rounds down too, too, too curved or too bird beaky down mm -hmm. here, you you hit, start hitting like this against the flat tip of the top right. of your blade. So you want that tip up a little bit. So when you get to someone's face or heart, you can move down. You can go straight in and move down, right? Yeah. Um, but that curved blade uh, does the best over rib cages and spinal cords and all kinds of weird ligaments and stuff. That curvature in the blade, for whatever reason, uh, I'm not a physicist or anything, but... Um, it, it works better and you get longer, deeper cuts on a carcass. Nice. Well, okay, good. So I've spent a lot of money on those knives. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully I have one on me when I run into a pig carcass. <laughs> um, so uh, like I mentioned before, going to um, Jamaica with my family, I've got two beautiful young daughters and uh, on the way, you know, I had to, I had to uh, have a uh, emergency contact. I contact my brother who's a very, world savvy guy he gets right back to me and says reconsider your travel to jamaica and he, he sent me the uh the the state department's warning and um you know while we were there i was aware that even though we were on one of these all exclusive resorts for this wedding the walls are easily scalable it's easy yeah. to just walk on the beach and get in um and also travel in the airports and uh and and that kind of thing what what kind of tips do you have for uh, people who whose uh, livelihood is not wrapped up in this kind of thing, but still has a lot to protect. Well, it's funny because when I when I talk from my soapbox, you got to remember that when I travel with artists, specifically with the A group or with the artists themselves, and I'm not on an advanced team or a production team, uh, we don't just roll into countries and you know and get off the ship or whatever, or get off the plane and walk into a taxi. That never happens that way. So. We make great plans that are big plans to travel around with police escorts and armored vehicles, et cetera. And, uh, you know, uh, we're insulated, so to speak. We have armed guys at our hotels and they, they, don't, they don't, we don't go anywhere by ourselves, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit different for us. Um, so uh, one second. Stand by. Computer was going to die. Sorry about that. Oh, good. No problem. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's a little bit different, uh, but I've been on production teams and, and uh, different uh, film crews and whatnot that go ahead of talent, you know, and, that, and you're on your own as well. Um, but, you know, when you look at State Department info, they're always going to err on the side of caution. They're not going to say, yeah, good to go, even if there's a little bit of disturbance, you know. Mm -hmm. I was just in the Amazon in Brazil, and it was pretty, I mean, you can get robbed for your AirPods or your phone, but you can get robbed like that in LA. You yeah. know, um, it's just about being aware and not flashing things around and and being, you know, you're, everyone's going to know you're not from there because of your clothing. You know, just like you could spot a European dude in the mall. Like, what shoes are those? I've never even seen those shoes in my life. You know, yeah. like, you just look different, your haircut different, your shirt isn't made the same, different fit. Um, you have different haircut or something, you know, so your clothes are going to tell on you right away. That's the first thing that people spot. And even if you think you're wearing plain clothes, you're not. You're wearing, you look like an American, dude. You know, <laughs> so uh, you have to know that about yourself. Um, but also, uh, you know, don't become an easy target. You know, if you're just paying attention, you're not being flashy and you're moving with a purpose, nine times out of 10, that'll save you, you know. Uh, a lot of the people that get rolled are just aloof or and not and not paying attention. Uh, I was just in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, about a month ago uh, for Lollapalooza, and there were a bunch of Americans. Like, there was like I don't know, 400 Americans staying in one hotel or something, and yeah. and just the the people, the bad guys, came out of nowhere on motorcycles, and they were just lurk, lurking around the hotel and. People ended up getting robbed people with famous crews, you know, for their cameras. They're walking around taking pictures with giant Canon cameras around their neck and it's just being stupid. So they just didn't know it was their first time. So they learned the hard way, you know. 
Um, but just just being smart and just paying attention. And uh, most of these countries are good to go. You know, uh, if, if you just if you have local contact, that's the best thing to do is have a local friend to show you around. You know, what about in general? Um, uh, you have a gut feeling, say you're out, uh, you know, you're out with your wife for the evening or you're with your kids at the movies or something. You have a gut feeling. Um, yeah, have you ever had some sort of gut feeling that you followed and you were glad you did? Yeah, you'll you'll understand the more you, you talk about gut feelings is that that's you're accessing folders in your brain that you've already seen. Whether it was in a movie, whether it was a story that someone told you when you're six years old, there's something in there that's that's making your hair crawl. And it's not just because, you know, you stayed at a Motel 6. It's because you've seen this before. You're like, yeah. I've seen this movie before. And it makes and you start, uh, you know, pulling it apart a little bit. You start deconstructing what's happening. You start looking around for other actors or other anomalies in the environment. Like, what else? Did the temperature drop? Did the lighting go up? Um, are people moving in one direction? Like, whatever it is, you know. Uh, but then you start to finish the story, don't you? That's what we're all guilty of. You start going... Well, this guy's probably homeless. Well, this guy's probably knocking on my door because he wants to sell me something. You have no idea, and it's not your responsibility to finish someone else's story. That's what I always tell people. That's not your job. <laughs> you know, uh, I always tell my kids, you know, they always, everyone does it. I do it too. And then I laugh about it immediately because I catch myself every time. Uh, when you see somebody, oh, that guy must be, he must be renting the house. <laughs> it's like, why do we do this, you know? So are you saying don't do that because you might be judging someone unnecessarily? Or are you saying don't do that because if you write the end of the story, you might be blindsided by what the story actually is? Nine times out of ten, we write it off as probably just something. That's what we want to do because we want to finish the story. And if oh, we can't finish the story, right. it'll just bug us, right? right. So it's okay to move off your uh, out of your environment. You know, If something doesn't feel right, we should go. I do it all the time. I mean, I'm the worst, and it's inconvenient for some people <laughs> in yeah. my life because I'm not staying here, dude. You know, and then it becomes like, oh, Ryan's doing his thing again. You know, he's just <laughs> he's okay. Got one, but got now of his feelings again. Yeah, but you know, most of the time, the people that actually know me really well go, "All right, I'm out of here too," because <laughs> if you're not comfortable, then I'm not comfortable. So. I'm not the kind of person that's easy to scare. So when I say that, people just get up with me. <laughs> they don't, if you if you really know me, you're going to stand up to even the hardest customers. Are like, yeah, I'm rolling out. Yeah, so, um, and that's a, that's a hard skill to learn with with clients, you know, because you're dealing with egos, aren't you? So it's like, well, you work for me, right? And I, I want to be here, and I have to do this, and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And you're like, well, you know, now you have me around to show you that to stick around longer and do what you're doing, you should probably start taking cues from some people that are paying attention to your best interests. You know? All right. Before we close, um, do you have a story, a good, a good uh, time that you foiled something or where your sixth sense, uh, your gut told you something and you saved the day? There's a lot of that. <laughs> Man, there's a lot of that. Anything weird or unusual? Yeah, uh, one of my favorites is the the I was uh, actually doing I was working for a pop star, and a lot of people don't know, but I was a security person turned assistant turned manager. So hmm. the big pop star female I was with for eight years that I, my my role shifted into this you know management position. So at that point I was hiring assistants and security people. So I've kind of seen different parts of the spectrum that most security guys have never really gone into the management world, you know? So, yeah. and then I came back. So I have this different vibe. Um, but I was working for this pop star and I was, I was out of LA for the better part of a decade, you know, working from Beverly Hills and doing my thing. Um, and I had a friend that was still on the move with another, a female artist uh, that he had tried to get me to work with on, on a project, uh, a band that had popped up really big and they're still pretty big. Uh, but the female artists got a lot of attention from weirdos, you know, there's all kinds of people are sending weird emails and mail to a fan club and all this other stuff. And um, like I said before, a fan had pointed out to some weird person online in a, in a group name uh, chat room or whatever. And this person was said that he was going to show up to a, a concert in Texas and, and blow everyone away with with this gun. <laughs> right. So he, there's pictures of him and his nuts. I mean, he's fully nude. <laughs> 
It looks like uh, Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill. Right? He looks just like that. From <laughs> Silence of the Lambs? <laughs> I got photos. I'll send them to you after this. Um, but it's like this weed on the table with pentagrams and then the shotgun and then more weed and then his nuts. And you're like, this guy is out of his mind, you know? And uh, my the, my friend was moving with this female artist and he couldn't deal with the secu- uh, the police in this guy's neighborhood. He didn't even know where he was at. He was just on Facebook and, and all the fans were trying to figure it out. And sometimes fan groups can, this buzz can grow so big in the fan space that it becomes news before it's news to you. Hmm. So it doesn't necessarily have to be 100% true or legitimate. If everyone's talking about it, that's what it is. <laughs> that's what's on your plate right now. So uh, when TMZ picks up a story, you better be ahead of that one. You know, So you have to investigate and look into it. But my buddy was moving too quick with her. They were in a different city every day, literally. And so he asked me to look into it because I had some downtime working from an office and uh, I just started ripping his social media apart, you know, creating fake accounts. <laughs> I, I did all, I played all kinds of games with this guy. Um, but I literally would stay awake all night and just mess with this guy <laughs> just to try to push him into this uncomfortable space where he would say, say something, you know, and just try to start dialogue. So he'd just have to talk. I didn't care what he was saying. Just talk to me because you're going to get, you're going to give up some sort of information along, along the line. And I just started posting pictures like I was him. And I pretended to be this guy. And then uh, he, which prompted him to post more pictures like, no, this is me. You see me? I'm here. Oh my God. And uh, in one of those pictures that he posted, there was a car with a license plate in the back. And that was it. So I ran the plate through a friend in Texas and got the address, called the chief of police over there. Ended up speaking to a sergeant, you know, and he's like, who? I tell him the whole story, who I am. I offer any kind of you know, validation. Who, how would you like to go about, you know, verifying I am who I say I am? And he just gets cold feet at the last second. He's like, Man, I don't even know who I'm talking to on the phone right now. Have a good day, sir. <laughs> like yeah. he just, he tells himself this is some sort of prank. This is too weird, you know? So I ended up calling the news station local to the police department and gave him the story and said, hey, look, here's what's going on. There's a concert tonight. It's the biggest thing in town. Our sergeant so and so hung the phone up on me and said, "Have a great day." So I wanted you guys to be there to record the whole thing because it'll be, you know, you win a, an award for it or something, you know. And then they called the police station, and then my phone rings right away, chief of police, right? So long story short, they go over there, they grab the kid. Yeah, he had the car loaded. It was his mom's car, it was his mom's shotgun. He did have a shotgun mm-hmm. obsession. They didn't think he'd actually do it, but everything was pointing that direction. So, um. That was one of those things where it could have been one of those life-changing American tragedies, you know, where wow. you just you just try to use whatever kind of creativity you know pops in your head. There's really no manual for that. You're just trying to <laughs> trick someone into doing something uh, from a different state, you know. So um, that was one of the more interesting uh, deals that I think we had, and a group deal too. So there was a couple of us working on it, which was pretty cool. And again, that's like a situation where it was social skills and the ability to manipulate someone, um, you know, emotionally, socially, uh, that that won out. It wasn't you, um, you know, stalking around trying to trying to find the guy and beat the crap out of him. Yeah. It was getting him with your brain. Uh, Ryan, I want to thank you so much for coming on. How how can people get in touch with you and find out about your courses and uh, how they can take them? Uh, right now, Instagram seems to be the best avenue. Um, I had a website set up for coursework uh, alone. Now it's a t-shirt mark, fieldworks.com, $5. Uh, so there's t-shirts up there uh, right now, but through Instagram, I answer everyone's messages. You know, I'm pretty good about it. Um, if I'm busy, I'm busy. You know, <laughs> I have notifications turned off. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> I don't spend my entire life on Instagram. Uh, so be forewarned and don't have your feelings hurt. <laughs> don't get back to you in a timely matter. Um, but, uh, I do get back to generally everyone. And I think everyone can tell you that um, I'm pretty good about it. Scrubbing. I have that. There's two kinds of people in the world, right? I don't have any red dots on my phone. There are no messages or unread emails on my phone. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm the other, I think I'm the other guy. <laughs> oh no, I'm zero guy. Man. There are, it'll drive me nuts. And, uh, so it's that, that weird constructive ADHD or whatever that I have. Um, so Instagram's the best way right now. Um, Fieldworks at uh, gmail.com as well. F-L-D-W-R-X at gmail.com is an email if you don't have Instagram. Um, but it looks like the rest of this year is pretty busy. I'm out with this uh, R&B artist for the next four months, and then I hop back to Kiss for two months to finish their career. 
over at Madison Square Garden in December, December 2nd. And then I'm going to probably fly out to Hawaii after that because it's going to be a long year from here on out. So uh, I'm hoping next year, uh, if I don't get picked up right away, I've got this contract that's kind of looming around. I don't know when it starts, but I'd like to have a couple months off where I do a few classes uh, around the country. Great. Well, uh, everyone, keep your eye out on FLD WRX Fieldworks on Instagram and uh, and keep your eye on uh, Ryan. Um, and I know you're all knife junkies out there, so you got to you got to take a look at this page because, man, your collection is beautiful. And I love your photographs, too. They're just really well done. And not for nothing. Your T-shirts are awesome. All this artwork you have kind of based around, uh, you know, your your little character and your sort of myth is is really awesome i love the look of the artwork so definitely go check that out ryan thanks again for coming on the knife junkie podcast it's been a pleasure all right great thanks for having me i appreciate you my pleasure don't take dull for an answer it's the knife junkies favorite sign off phrase and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise like a t-shirt sweatshirt hoodie long sleeve tee and more even on coasters tote bags a coffee mug water bottle and stickers let everyone know that you're a knife junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkies merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Atkinson, Fieldworks. Uh, such interesting information to me. Uh, I could talk about this stuff for a long time. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be talking... Uh, for another 15 minutes with Ryan, uh, if you are a patron, you'll be able to hear that. Um, some very interesting stuff. Uh, but uh, even if you are not, uh, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Uh, I think this would make a great companion piece to the interview with uh, Ed Calderon. Uh, be good to get an update from him as well. So, uh, Ryan Atkinson, thank you very much. And thank you for watching the Knife Junkie podcast. Be sure to check in with us next Sunday for another interview with a fantastically interesting person. My name is Bob DeMarco, saying for Jim Person, working his magic behind the switcher. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.